State lawmakers see electronic cigarettes as a threat to public health, especially among youth and young adults. They want to include e-smoking devices in the definition of tobacco products, ban the sale of flavored products, including mint and menthol, and use money from fee and tax hikes for education and prevention. Should Hawaii increase regulations on vaping? Tonight's live broadcast and live stream of insights on PBS Hawaii start now. Aloha, and welcome to Insights on PBS Hawaii. I'm Daryl Huff. Five months ago on this program, we asked what role government should be playing in regulating vaping devices or e-cigarettes. That was just as health officials across the country were starting to investigate dozens of illnesses linked to vaping. As of two weeks ago, at least 60 people in 27 states have died and nearly 2,700 nationwide have been hospitalized due to vaping-related lung injuries. On January 2nd, the federal government announced it would enforce tougher rules on vaping products, but Hawaii is following other states in considering even stronger laws to stop what health officials described as an epidemic among young people. Our guests tonight include a state senator, a pediatrician, and a school teacher with knowledge of vaping on campus. We look forward to your participation in tonight's show. You can email, call, or tweet your questions, and you'll find a live stream of this program at pbshawaii.org and the PBS Hawaii Facebook page. Now to our guests. Senator Rosalind Baker from Maui chairs the Commerce, Consumer Protection, and Health Committee. She has sponsored at least two bills, and probably more, <laughs> proposing strict new regulations on vaping. Dr. Brian Mee is a pediatrician in private practice and director of the Smoke-Free Families Program at Kapilani Medical Center. He is also an assistant professor of pediatrics at the UH Medical School and has been awarded for his efforts at tobacco prevention and control. And Steve Bortle is a teacher at Campbell High in Eva Beach, Oahu, who has firsthand experience with teenage vaping on campus as well as at home. Now, we reached out to the vaping industry and tobacco lobbyists, but no one was willing or available to appear on tonight's program. A vaping store owner did appear in our previous program, and we have an ex excerpt from that show that will provide his perspective a little bit later on. Let me start, though, with Steve Bortle. You know, a lot has happened since that show. I, I actually, thinking about it this week, all, almost all of the injuries, the deaths and everything occurred after October, October, November. It was late in the year. Has it affected kids? Are they getting the message out there from what you can see as a teacher? Um, hard to totally to tell. Um, there is times like leaving campus, like if I'm driving home, I could, I would see kids like off campus uh, vaping uh, as long as like elementary or middle school students. Um, for my particular class, we go off campus quite often, like at least about twice a week. Um, and so we'll see other, there's a community park right across the street from Campbell High School. And so a lot of kids hang out. And it's hard to tell if they're former students or they're skipping class or, you know, they're, they're at that age. And there's a, lot of, there's a lot of vaping going on. So it's kind of hard to totally tell if it's totally died down. But I would hate to say it, but I'd say no. Mm -hmm. um, it's interesting because the last time when your guys' show was, that's about the same time that I cut my daughter for the third time at the house with finding the product, the vaping product in the house. And so I started doing my research and that's when I started paying attention. I started trying to get more involved with uh, bringing anti-vaping campaign kind of stuff onto the school. Um, and just doing the research and just seeing the news come out like CNN or the other different broadcasting channels, just how much more was being reported, like how many deaths had occurred. It went from, I think, initially it's like 10 or five or something, it was low numbers. And then just every week it was just- How did that affect your daughter when you talked about it? Did, would, did, would you, did she get scared once she saw that? She was more worried, in which I thought was interesting that she was more worried of what they call a vape-plosion, nicknaming it. And, and it's like where the battery pack for the oh. actual canister, the lithium battery, I guess, malfunctions and catches fire in people's pockets. She, that was more worried That's about that than having some kind of lung illness. Interesting. You know, Dr. Um, Dr. Me, what have you seen in terms of people appearing and uh, with, I mean, are people still being injured by these products from what you could tell? So we, we want to separate the, the two things. So that's the lung injury cases that we were seeing a lot of, um, you know, since the latter part of last year, which 
did increase a bunch, and then uh, the CDC was able to identify one of the substances as uh, the culprit. Uh, the e-cigarette industry says, great, that's our culprit, the rest of our product is fine. But we know from uh, various research studies that the components that go into the e-cigarette or the nicotine liquid are not safe in themselves. The nicotine, of course, is highly addictive. Um, the propylene glycol, which is the most common uh, solvent that they use, is also um, an airway irritant. And then the flavoring agents, they're not natural flavorings. It's not a squeeze of lime in there. They're actually uh, taking chemicals, mixing them up, and turning them into artificial flavors. Um, and those, when you use them in conjunction with the propylene glycol, can turn into airway irritants as well. Um, do you find, though, that there's more concern about it among your patients and among their families about this? I mean, is there conversations happening that weren't happening before? There's definite increase in the um, interest in talking about it from the parents, from the schools, and from my uh, colleagues in the healthcare field as well. So uh, the awareness has gone up, um, but there's still a lot of education that we need to do to you know, help young people understand, help the general public understand the health hazards from these devices. Senator Baker, you know, in this environment, I mean, uh, what's happened before and how do you think it might change now at the legislature in terms of what you're able to accomplish when it comes to these kinds of regulations? Well, I think the spotlight's being shined on some of the issues that have already been identified. The health risks, uh, the fact that, you know, you can you're putting things into your lungs that have no business being there. None of these products are FDA approved or uh, considered to be safe and healthful. So I'm hoping that we'll be able to address some of those issues by raising the price of them, taxing them uh, better, uh, making sure that uh, the education continues and uh, you know maybe we require warning labels among other things. Boy, this question came in right on the moment, are they considering increasing taxes on vaping and vaping products to deter vaping? Um, how, how are they, start off, how are they taxed now? I mean, how does it compare to say cigarettes in terms of the amount of tax? They're not as high as cigarettes. Still? Yes. How much more, do, do you see that being something to consider? Oh, I, I think particularly when you're trying to make sure that young people don't go uh, to a vaping product, you've got to raise the price because young people are very price sensitive. So I think that's one of the things that we'll want to do. I have a bill in that we're going to be hearing on February the 5th, uh, a number of uh, the anti-vaping measures that we'll really look at. If we put it in the tobacco uh, section of the Hawaii Revised Statute, so then you'll get a lot more regulation, increased price, as well as having to have permits to sell, registering uh, folks where they are selling, and it will help us with enforcement. Um, Steve, when you look at the way kids access these products, do you think price is going to make a big difference to them? It depends, I guess, how much price you're talking about. If it goes from like $20 bottle to $40 for the bottle, that, maybe it if it doubles I, the cost, I, 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 I don't I really know. But very, do, me, do me a favor. I really know very little about this. I've never vaped my kids I don't think they did, but um, did how does it work? And I, I've sort of heard of the Jewel thing, but you've got to buy a product that's in a bottle. Just can you describe how it works? Yeah. So with the the Jeweling, and it's not. I haven't noticed that that is particularly popular in Hawaii. It's more of the. It's so like the Jewel is you have like the device. It almost looks like a USB thumb drive right. or flash drive, and it has the non-refillable, you know, e-cigarette the juice or the vaping juice that goes into it, connects into it, and then the, you inhale. It's like a cartridge? Yeah, it's, yeah a cartridge. Okay. So from my understanding that the, it's, there is a band coming on that for flavor, but for what I've seen kids using in Hawaii, that's not like the, the product that they're being used. It's more like the, it looks like a bigger device, almost looks like a, a cell phone rechargeable battery that has like this mouthpiece on it. That's what I've seen. And you know, you buy this other, you know, it looks like a big gigantic eye drop it, droplet and you, you drop it in the, in the device and then you close it back up and then you inhale on the mouthpiece. So, so when we talk about, Dr. Maybe you can help you with this too, is it so if 
the price is, is it like a printer where you buy the printer cheap and then the, the ink costs a lot? I mean, is it that how it works? So that's a really good analogy. Yeah. So um, for Joule and other devices, you, you know, you have the actual device and then the, the little things are called pods that contain the nicotine uh, e-liquid in there. And so, you know, you could buy that or you could mix your own. There's a lot of variety to it. So um, what you're doing is purchasing, you know, the, the device and then you're, you can get different flavors in the different pods and, you know, they'll cost a certain amount. I think we looked up this morning, you could get a pack of four of those for about $16. And so, you know, we know that... How, long is, how much is that? How long does that last? Or is it... Depends on how quickly you go through one of those. So, you know, some of these kids can actually uh, go through a pod pretty quickly. Um, each one of those pods can be the equivalent of uh, one to two packs worth of cigarettes. So that's 20 to 40 oh, cigarettes. Oh, really? Yeah. So you're talking about four pods for 16 bucks when the equivalent amount of cigarettes would cost you a mint, right? <laughs> I mean, it's, so, so it's, when it comes to taxing this, just to... To, to respect this, this viewer's question, um, with all these different devices and all these different things, how, how is it that you can write legislation that's gonna work? Do we, are there formulas and things that you can, you can know that if you put this dollar figure on this amount or this dollar figure on this amount that you're gonna come up with the right formula? Is there a trick to that? Well, I don't know whether there's a trick to it, but I think we can look at what other states have done and we can also look at our uh, cigarette laws and figure out how we're going to put them in, uh, put the pods or the e-liquids in that, because that's really what uh, is the most damaging. You know, that's what goes into your lungs, and that's what causes the irritation. Now, I've heard that when they, you talk about raising taxes on something, one of the things that I've always heard lobbyists say for the tobacco industry, for example, is, oh, well, then the government gets addicted to the money. Um, and do you direct the money that comes from that to back into the problem? Well, it depends on how we write the legislation, but the proposals that I've seen would have it go into education, would have it go into uh, some other kinds of enforcement uh, so that you know, it's not just a, a source of revenue. And I think that's the thing that people miss. The reason that you raise the price of something, particularly if you're trying to keep people away from it, is because it's a deterrent to them buying it. The more expensive, the more taxes on it, then it's gonna make it less attractive for young people to purchase. Let me um, talk a little bit more about the youth vaping, vaping epidemic. We have, some, we have some graphics. This is from a 2017 study, I think, that really opened a lot of people's eyes. I think it was pretty shocking where it turned out that Hawaii had the largest proportion of our student population vaping. Um, the number was 42% of high school students had tried it, 27% of middle school students. We're talking about kids who are 11 and 12 and 13 years old, right? Yeah. And then um, by county, it was also interesting, there was quite a lot of variation from county to county. This could be because of the number, the samples of people, but Hawaii County was 50%, Kauai County 42, Honolulu was only 39, Maui County was 51, the state average being 42. Um, Steve Bortle, what have you seen that works with kids? Is there a message that works that you found, or is it you just gotta individually figure out? Is it, I think it, you know, depending on where they're getting caught at, you know, with the school, I think now that there has been such a larger problem, and it's, it's a lot to do with the community. That's the number one thing. I'm talking with different people, with you know, principals, vice principals, different admin, uh, different teachers. They found that what works best is talking with the community, talking with the parents. Um, a lot of times, you know, the parents think that it's, it's better than cigarettes because that's what it was advertised, right? That you vape to get off of smoking. So they literally be relieved if they see their kid vaping because they're figuring he'd be smoking. It's, yeah, it's, uh, it's, well, yeah, it's better. And, you know, and going in with that, too, is saying the reason why kids are vaping rather than smoking, smoking is dropping, vaping is increasing. You know, you can vape and get away with it with just if you're in, living in a non-smoking house, you know, if you go and smoke a cigarette, you're going to come in, you're going to be caught just for the smell. Like, where have you been at? You've been with your friends smoking? Oh, no, I don't smoke. But then with the vaping, it, it has all these different flavors, you know, different smells to it, and the kids can just blow it off. And what my daughter was blowing off, it's like, oh, it was just, that's my, that's my perfume. 
And I'm like, I don't think that's perfume, but for like, Did it was like out weeks. What, what, was, what was in it? In terms of what, what, what she was actually. I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to. No, I don't it, was, it was like some privacy. kind of like cotton candy flavored and I could smell it and she had spilled it or something in her room. And so that's, and I could, it was such a strong smell that I could smell it. I could find it in her room by the scent. But it was just but for the, fun for her? It wasn't like, um, a, she wasn't taking nicotine or something like that, was it? Or? Well, so she, she uh, reported herself like on accident, kind of like spilled the beans, right. you know, to say like, oh, it's not nicotine, it's just for fun. It's just for, because that's another thing too. I don't know if you know, but it's like a thing that, they have contests of how big of a cloud they can make, how far they can blow this cloud. So it goes beyond even just the enjoyment of like what someone would be smoking a cigarette. It's like the idea of like it's a, toy. a cigar where you can blow these rings and oh, can I make a pirate ship out of it and blow it through the ring or you know, crazy but, different things. But yeah. there's but there's nicotine in every one of those e-liquids. Right. Yeah. That's what I was wondering. And they advertise it as and it's, not. And it's very before. addictive. And the kids don't understand that. And there's the nicotine salt. Uh, so there's like most the two types. You have the the base and then the free base and then the salt. The salt is like about three times the potency, and that's what I caught my daughter using. And she admitted that she said she was addicted. And it first turned out that she wanted to be cool. She was at a different school. Then mm -hmm. she transferred into our school. So she wanted to be cool and hang out and oh, I'm going to look like you guys. I want to fit in. I need more friends. It turned from that into, you know. Being having anxiety about just high school life, everyday life in high school, you know, with hormones and everything else changing, and then felt the need to, oh, it calms me down. Let me ask, doctor. So yeah, talk about what does nicotine addiction look like in these kids? So quickly to talk about the flavors, we found that about two thirds of young people actually start just because of the flavor without realizing that there's nicotine in the e-cigarettes. But unfortunately, once you start because of the flavor, you continue because you become addicted to the nicotine. And then the uh, nicotine salts, so the, the best way that I like to explain it is they, they take a nicotine base, which is nicotine that you find in, in cigarettes and some of the older e-cigarettes. And what happens is when you uh, vape that, you kind of have the throat burning, irritation. But what Juul discovered was you could take uh, the nicotine base, add sulfuric acid to it or benzoic acid to it and neutralize that and you didn't get the irritation so you can take a much deeper inhalation from that. So that plus the very pleasant flavors means you are inhaling very deeply and getting a lot more nicotine in each inhalation as well. Senator, when you hear this, and I know you've heard it before, but does this remind you, I mean, you're, you've been health chair long enough to remember the whole tobacco process that, that Hawaii went through to try and cut back on tobacco, yeah. the, the whole issue of marketing to children and so on, yes. which was blatant yes. by the tobacco industry. Well, but to, Big Tobacco owns most of the vape companies. Altria, you know, they're, they're not getting out of the business. They've just hooked on to another way to hook millions of people addict them to nicotine. And then, so, when you start regulating this, the, the argument, and, and we actually have a piece of, uh, of tape from the, the gentleman that was on the show back in August talking about marketing to kids. And um, I'm gonna set it up a little bit, but this, again, this is August. This is before the injuries and deaths had occurred. But the question then was very much, you know, um, you know, are you going after children? Now, uh, you know, I'm going to remind our viewers that we mentioned at the top of this program, no one we approached in the vaping industry accepted our invitation to be here. But in this show last summer, the vape shop owner from the Big Island did come in and had this to say about how they marketed their products. Nobody made this thinking, ooh, we can get the kitty started. I mean, it's a cool design. You know what I mean? The, being open and looking at something going, that's cool. Lamborghini, that's cool. A kid thinks a Lamborghini looks cool too. It's not marketed towards the kid. They're marketed towards adult smokers, period. I mean, that's it. If a, cool, if a kid thinks something is cool, I'm, you know, the, the vape industry isn't targeting children. That's, there are millions, millions of smokers that want to stop, that are of age. And that is who we target. I mean, we lose customers 
every month because they started at a six or a three or they started with a 55 for the pod or something, then they went down to a 35, then they jumped back down into um, the more uh, cloud, the, those ones, then go to a zero, and then they stop. We, I mean, the business model doesn't make sense. We don't mind losing customers because there's so many more smokers to take their place. But to say that <laughs> the vape industry is making devices so kids can get away with it. It's absolutely absurd, uh, with all due respect. I mean, that's just, that's crazy. Adults still enjoy visual. They enjoy candy, Skittles, you know what I mean? They enjoy all of these things. Um, if kids do too, well, we've got to work on getting them out of the kids' hands. Uh, Steve, brother, you, you had the, the, the strongest reaction to that, but I could hear the eyes rolling around the table. Um, <laughs> What was your thinking when you heard what he was saying? Well, the fact that they're not creating things for kids to get away with vaping. When there's like stuff like vapeware, that's like a hoodie, where they have a you have the draw cords, right? One draw cord so on this side goes into like a little pocket. That so they have different other kind of ones of vapes that look like they look like a pen and called a pen vape. And so it attaches to like a hose on one side and it goes around to the other side of the drawstring. And so then you bring it up, well, it's the mouthpiece for the device. And so the kid inhales it, there's a button or something or a button on the, the what looks like a draw cord and inhales it and then they're vaping with what it looks like a, a hoodie. So when you're looking at someone you just look like, man, they're just fidgeting. They're chewing on the end of their drawstring when they're actually vaping. And there's videos too by gentlemen like this one on YouTube there's there's hundreds of them of like different ones that they argue about what he's arguing and they have videos of like how to get away with vaping oh go ahead 81 percent of youth who ever used a tobacco product started with a flavored product so why do you think that the vape industry is putting so much into flavors they're not going after the adult market they are trying to hook kids, and they're doing a very good job of it. Um, the uh, federal government's, I'll call it an effort for lack of a better word, <laughs> uh, is to mostly go after the flavored products. Does that, do you think that's enough? No. no. But I think we need to ban the flavored products, mm -hmm. absolutely. And then I think we need to, to raise the price on all of them. You know, you, you made an interesting point, Doctor, about they may be trying to ban the flavored products, but then some of the flavors are still going through and those are just as insidious. Right, so, you know, there's a giant loophole in the FDA proposal to, to ban the flavor, just the pods, but you can still get the refillable uh, tank type systems. And we all know you can go onto YouTube, find ways to modify, um, you know, whatever device you have and then get, get around the, the temporary or partial ban that they're proposing. And the ban also should include uh, things like mint and menthol, which uh, the cigarette and e-cigarette industry want to exclude because they know that those, uh, they're flavors, but they're also special in a way. Um, you know, if you think about cigarettes, there's menthol cigarettes, and that menthol component actually helps take away some of that throat burn as well. And it's been marketed insidiously as well to um, some of our more underprivileged populations. So on the one hand, the um, vaping industry will say, yes, this is meant to be a cessation device only for adults. But what we have seen in real life is they introduced it on the market without any of that um, as their goal, right? And if they truly wanted to introduce a uh, cessation device, it wouldn't need the flavors. You have plenty of people who are addicted to nicotine. You can switch over to a no flavor thing, no big deal. But you don't need gummy bear, you don't need ice cream cake, you know, you don't need mango flavoring. That's like putting a cake on the table and telling, you know, your kids, don't eat this cake. You know, um, uh, good question from a viewer. I wasn't aware that all of these products had nicotine. Yes. I mean, and so, the, the question comes, does the panel think that young people are aware of the harm from nicotine? Do they even know, it sounds like a lot of them don't even know there's nicotine in the products that they're, they're breathing. No, no 
Go ahead. Well, like I said with my, my daughter, like her worry was more the, the vape plosion that her device is going to blow up in her purse or her pocket and catch her on fire and give her third degree burns rather than, you know, having the idea of like my brain is developing and nicotine is going to impede my development, you know. And so I think that's a big one where kids don't understand where that's the problem of thinking, well, you know, I talked with a guy who smokes and vapes and he said that. Well, nicotine's not a problem. It's in tomatoes. It's in other different nightshade plants and these different things. It's part of the, you know, it's natural. But, you know, the, it's children, maybe as an adult, they would choose so. They have a, they can make it their own education, educated, you know, decision. But as a child, you know, using it, there's definitely, I think the pediatrician can speak well better than I can for it. But, it, you know, from what I've read, it impedes, like, development. Yeah, well, let's, yeah. Yeah, what, what is the danger? Is it, it, I mean, it's got to be better than smoking a cigarette, right? I mean, I'm just throwing that out. That I know that's... It's, it's different. So, like, I like to say you, you pick your, your hazard, right? So there's the, the old cigarettes that you smoke. We know the health hazards from these, those. With the vaping devices, we don't know all the hazards yet, but the evidence keeps building up, right? The evidence of lung injuries, uh, folks having seizures, and also the addiction from the nicotine at much, much higher concentrations than, than you can get from regular cigarettes. We've heard cases of people who are so addicted to vaping that they're using regular cigarettes to get back down off of it. And the issue with the uh, impact of nicotine on the developing brain is really, really important. So we know that the brain is still developing up until about the mid-20s. So the issues are that nicotine affects um, the parts of the brain that deal with impulse control. If you think about, you know, when you're a teenager, how many stupid things did you do, right? Those are all from not having fully developed in impulse control. But we've also found that if you use nicotine for long term, it permanently impacts that impulse control. It affects mood and behavior. We find people who are so addicted um, to it, and it also affects, you know, are they, are they feeling anxious or depressed as well? And you're thinking they're getting more nicotine in their bodies or in their brains now than they would have been if they were smoking cigarettes. Well, either way, it's a, it's a harm. So, right. I mean, the best thing to do would be to not have those around. At the very least, you know, we should treat this like a tobacco product, right? It, it's, it walks like tobacco, it quacks like tobacco, it pretty much smokes similar to tobacco, and the nicotine that we're getting is basically from, from tobacco as well. So. You know, I, I've got a couple of questions here along this line, and there, one is, is there hard data showing if adolescent vape, vaping does or does not reduce tobacco use later in life? And then the other flip side, caller thinks that taxes should not be increased on vaping if it is truly a way to help adults get off smoking. Um, I, I, doctor, I keep coming to you yeah. on, this, on these sort of scientific things, but yeah, is, I mean, this claim that it is an effective smoking cessation device, is that true? That is completely false. Oh. So we have found that um, the people who start vaping, they are four times more likely to start regular cigarette smoking sometime later on in their life. We've also seen, uh, there's a statistical uh, analysis where they found that, yes, maybe you can get one adult to quit smoking, but for that one adult, 81 young people will pick up vaping and be addicted to nicotine. Wait, say that again. The ratio is one to 81. So if, if what the e-cigarette industry says is true, you can use this to quit. Okay, so this is a product that's available and you can get them to quit. So that's one adult but 81 young people will pick up the habit. So this is not a good cessation product because it's, you know, it's just sold in the store. Are you going through a trained medical professional to you know, taper your dose down carefully? Are you being supervised for side effects? The answer is no. How much training does that person have that's, that's giving you your nicotine? And how do they know how to adjust it, right? If we're truly talking about cessation, needs to be done carefully supervised in the, in the correct way. Um, uh, Steve Bordelag, I had another question here, and this might be going a little off topic, but if there are regulations against smoking on campus, why do these regulations not apply to vaping? I think that's a misunderstanding, right? I mean, is it... Is it yeah, you cannot vape on campus. What happens on your campus now if someone's caught with, with vaping material? So the security would, or depending on who catches them, security will take them into the admin, the vice principal, and then they... They hold the, the, either the equipment, the, 
the pod, the whatever the device, and then the liquid, whatever is caught, and that's held at the school. Um, so there's debate on that, and there's different schools have different policies. Uh, as far as Campbell goes, is that they call the parent and they give them so many days to come and pick up the device, which some of us teachers feel that that is maybe shouldn't be the correct way of going about it. But then there's a because the legal device concern. Goes back, the device goes back into the household. Correct. Yeah, and I guess some what the parents then argue is saying, well, they stole my device, and so oh. as me being a parent and a teacher, I'd say, well, then you should be fined because you didn't lock up your device or you didn't have it on yourself and allowed your child who's underage to have access to this, access to poison. It sounds like you feel like though, even though there's policies out there that it could be tougher and it could be more directed at the whole family. Oh, totally. I mean, the fines, like, I don't think they're, they're substantial at all for a, a student or someone under 21 to get, that gets busted. I think it's like $250 if that maybe or their stuff is just taken. If like a police officer sees a child out, I think he'll just take it. What is the law now on youth vaping? I mean, what are the controls of it? Well, you're supposed to be 21 before you can purchase, legally purchase, and before you're supposed to use vapes or cigarettes. And that's what you, that was what was passed last year? Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's the most recent. Um, what happened last year in terms of the efforts you were making, because you, you were on this last year. What happened to the legislation? Well, we didn't pass all of the things that I think we can pass, and so we're going to be looking at those measures again. Uh, we want to make sure that uh, vaping is part of the tobacco products statute. That brings registration, it brings additional fines, it brings... Uh, registration of who? Of... Uh, sales? The salespeople. salespeople. Uh, you have to have a permit to sell cigarettes. You need to have a permit in order to vape. Uh, it would also make sure that um, the price would increase. So I think there's some, and, it, and it's acting like a cigarette, even though it's not uh, per se, but because it's acting that way and it's addicting people and nicotine is the root of it, then it belongs in the tobacco product statute and all of the restrictions that come with it. Is that something that not all lawmakers have quite gotten to yet, though, in terms of educating themselves on, because you've been immersed in this for, for years, and so how close do you think is the rest of the legislature to doing this and recognizing that this is a nicotine, uh, a nicotine, what do they call it, nicotine? Cessation? Deli it's a delivery, delivery system. Okay. A nicotine delivery system, yeah. right. Is everybody kind of on board with that? Are there still people that say, no, nah, we still need to make sure this is available to smokers? I believe that people more and more are getting on board with it, particularly when you're talking about people that are under uh, the age of 21. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, I think, you know, as with everything else, you always continue the education process. But I think more and more people understand that this really is harmful and that's one of the things that our young people don't get is you're putting things into your lungs that if you ate them would be perfectly fine, but they're destroying their lungs. You know, um, Steve, you could try this too. Is it, do you, where, do you, where do you think the kids are getting most of this stuff? It's, it's, it's off the internet for the most part also, right? Or is well, it? You can, the, I mean, yeah. you can go to, you just go onto Google and put vape or e-cigarettes and you know, you get all the different ads online. It's so funny. And you, know, you can just lie and say, yeah, I'm 21. You go to a supermarket, you get a Visa gift card, and you buy, you pay cash, and then you can just buy it. Most kids are going to get home before their parents. Parents work till probably Especially four Hawaii, to five. Right? The kids get out at one or two. They're going to get home. They check their mail. They get their product. and Or they even can, for what I've been told, they can go to a kiosk that's in the mall, and that's why I was going to ask the senator, is, is that on the bill to remove that? Because you don't see cigarettes being sold in the middle of a mall. Why do we have e-cigarettes being sold in the middle of a mall? But so there's kiosks? I, I feel I, very no, I, I, I agree. Uh, yeah, in Kahumanu Center, yes, they've been there. 
Per Ridge Mall, you per got Ridge a couple, Mall. you got, you know. So a machine that dispenses? Oh, no. No, no, it's people. It's yeah. people. It's oh, okay. Oh, I, I and, you know, they're supposed to then check to see if you're oh, 21. Oh, you said vend Okay, I got you. It, it's right. a kiosk, you know. Yeah. It's oh, kiosk. A, I thought of a yeah. vending machine. No, yeah, no, 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 it's a, it's not, quite there. It's not in a store, it's in, you know. But, the, you know, yes. it's interesting, to, this question from a viewer, if we make vaping products too expensive or even illegal, is there a risk that a black market emerges with the Internet? What, what's the black market anymore? It's the Internet, right? Well, with, with tobacco, if you go online and try to have it sent into Hawaii, the, ad po or the message pops up that it's not legal to do that. Mm -hmm. We need to have that for vape products as well. It may not stop everything, but it would certainly make a significant difference, I think. Um, your legislation, you also want to um, ban the flavors too, right? Yes. Including menthol. And yes. Okay. Um, and that was a question. Because men menthol is the key flavor to help people learn how to vape, get used to the uh, draw. And it was really clear when big tobacco couldn't get into some of the communities when they put menthol in and gave it to them, it, people were able to draw and they got addicted. Um, doctor, I, so I got a question here. Can you address the potential dangers associated with cannabis and vaping? And um, also, Steve, maybe you could weigh in on this. Do you, do you feel like a lot of kids are using this to access um, THC? Well, since we've seen that they can modify the devices, yes, a lot of people are using it for THC as well. How easy is it to do that? Um, I mean, same as anything else. You look it up online or you, you find a friend and there are what they call quote-unquote reputable dealers and there are quote-unquote unreputable dealers. But basically, um, this is an unregulated industry and so, you know, you can get your THC and you can find ways to, to vape it as well. So this is a, a a problem as well and just the fact that um, you know you can alternate whether it's THC or nicotine doesn't really matter a lot of people are dual users uh, we found you know the vast majority actually are if you're using THC you're probably also using nicotine but think about the components as well the you know the the solvent the propylene glycol the flavoring agents those are still dangerous to to you. Um, you may find contaminants in some of the unregulated, um, you know, cheaper uh, THC oil that you can get. Um, that was the reason also for the uh, lung injury was the THC oil was being diluted with the vitamin um, E acetate. And so um, that's just a, kind of a thick liquid agent that's similar to the you, THC you oil. You mentioned earlier that, you know, the, um, the CDC or the, the, the industry, health industry, discovered this combination that was leading to the mm -hmm. most severe injuries and the deaths was the THC and the, that vitamin E. That, was that the component you were talking about? Correct, yes. So, so now that they've identified that, what do you think is going to happen? So uh, the e-cigarette industry says, oh great, we've identified the culprit. It's not us. It's this THC containing oil and mixture with vitamin E acetate. Yeah. Come back and use our product. But we have to go back and think about what are the components of that product, nicotine, which is addictive, uh, other things that are airway irritants, things that are heavy metals, things that are um, volatile organic compounds, so like stuff that you find in, in paint, um, you know, things that are heavy metals. So these are all bad things for you. They're not meant to be inhaled into the lungs. So again, we have to go back and think about why are we calling it vaping? That was what the industry wanted us to call it. They wanted us to associate vaping with water vapor, right? Mm. Because we initially call these things e-cigarettes or electronic nicotine delivery systems, but with a, their incessant marketing, you know, they got everyone to call it vaping, and that's what we're calling it now. But we have to go back and remember, this is aerosolized chemicals. That's really interesting. I had not thought of that before because, yeah, the vernacular we use in the media all the time is vaping, vaping, vaping. I didn't realize that there was an insidious motive behind even that word. Steve, when you, when you deal with this at schools and with the kids, are a lot of kids getting high in school from uh, THC in the vape? Do you know? As far as like percentage-wise, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I know that there are kids that, who are using and experimenting with that, um, you know, outside school or inside school. Um, there have been health issues that have been reported that I've talked with other uh, admin about that 
that hasn't, I don't think, hit the news because either the parents haven't reported, or I mean, you can't report someone's medical problems, right, and cross broadcast the news unless it's consented. Um, but then again, too, with like looking at, it almost feeds into the kids to use the regular nicotine because then it's being reported on the news saying that, oh, it's the THC, it's the CBD that's the culprit. So, ah, oh, it is safe. So they might have paused it when they saw all the deaths oh, being reported. Right. And then, then they're like, oh, it's, it's the vitamin E, it's a CBD. Well, I'm not using that. So I'm, I'm just using nicotine, so I'm, I'm safe. You know, that's the mentality because they're addicted, they enjoy it. And so they're tricking themselves with the whole marketing you know, scheme of it saying it's vaping, it's not water vapor. Right. And so it's like something I want to do with uh, some of the media uh, kids on campus is to run little like little, little PBAs that they'll produce and to say like, okay, are we fish for one? Do we, are we breathing water? Is it something that we go in and breathe water, you know? And then- Does it uh, make it right? <laughs> and then show like, you know, you know, a thing of like uh, vegetable oil and say, we don't, we don't inhale oil. We're not, we can't possibly breathe this either. We're not going to be able to breathe water. We can't breathe oil. So why would you want to stick any of that and then all this other extra additive If you can get stuff. kids to, to think that far down the line, <laughs> you're going to be further ahead than most teachers. But um, Senator Baker, uh, you're also involved in the um, medical cannabis side of the, of the equation here. Um, a lot of, as I understand it, and again, I'm, I'm not an expert on this, a lot of people who uh, need cannabis or THC for their medical conditions like the idea of vaping it, or uh, maybe I'll find another word for that. I don't know if I can, but finding a way to aerosolize it through these devices. Um, is that something that in, in, in... But medical cannabis doesn't have that much THC in it. That's not the purpose of it. Oh, so... It's that, a different, it's actually a different plant. Okay, uh, so, so just, but so I don't, so, so if you heavily regulate this industry, are we going to be harming the people who actually feel they need THC for their medical conditions because they, they want to use those kind of devices? Or is it just not the same thing? It's not the same thing. I mean, we have dispensaries, licensed dispensaries, so we know how the cannabis is grown, what the conditions are, uh, what the products are that are available for people to use, and it's highly regulated. Vaping is not that regulated at the moment, and I think that's one of the areas that we need to put some significant regulations on. Um, and, uh, Dr. Lee, if I could go back to you a little bit more about the injuries that you're seeing. As, as Steve was saying, you, you had deaths, you had severe, you know, uh, acute lung illnesses that were caused by this, got a lot of coverage, that has died down almost as quickly as it feels like as it fired up. I mean, I'm like, that whole thing happened in like two months and then when we're done, right? So are we, what other health effects do you see from, 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 from vaping that might not be as publicized or scary as, as Steve is saying? Well, first of all, we're not done because, you know, the CDC is still reporting new cases. Uh, they give us an update every week. So like we talked about at the beginning of the show, you know, 2,700 people hospitalized and 60 people died from just the lung injury associated with uh, vaping. But the other health effects, you know, we're going to find these out over time, right? It's, it's similar to when, you know, people started smoking, um, you know, it took years to figure out the health effects from that. But we should kind of learn from what we've seen in the past. And we already know because there's been research done on it that it affects the um, pliability of our blood vessels. So that means you know we have difficulty with exchanging oxygen in the lungs. Um, you know we can have problems in the brain, like we talked about already, because it affects the developing brain. There's uh, reports of people who suffered from seizures because of the nicotine poisoning in there. Uh, nicotine will raise your heart rate, your blood pressure. Um, it will actually increase, I think, about double your risk of a heart attack. Um, you can get different, you know, gastrointestinal effects as well. So you get stomach ache, nausea, vomiting. So these are both short-term and long-term problems. Uh, one of the most research, one of the most recent research things that I saw, uh, the paper 
had looked at you know whether it increases your chance of um, cancer and it was looking at bladder cells um, heart cells and the answer was yes in in this model that they looked at as but well Senator, how did this how did we get here I mean <laughs> uh, you you deal all the time with uh, lobbyists for for big tobacco and for products that might be only for you know, adult products and so on um, but it feels like this came out of left field, you know, that people, the regulatory system wasn't ready for it. So what do you think, what do you think happened? Is it, why did we not catch this ball when it was thrown at us? Well, I'm not sure that we didn't catch it, but, you know, it's, let's call it what it is. It's smoking with an electronic device. And I think had we sort of had that translation early on, we could have just rolled it in to the laws that are already on the books. Now we're probably looking at uh, specializing laws to make sure that these items are covered. But um, yeah, it's electronic smoking, and we should call it that. And I think that's the answer rather than calling it vaping because it doesn't sound so horrible. It sounds like, oh, it's just water vapor, and it's not. And I think that's where our kids are really missing the boat. They think it's benign, and it's not. It's not benign at all. It can kill you. So the term, termination, the, the, the terminology of electronic smoking, do you think that would get the idea better in kids' heads, Steve? Uh, you know, I think they're going to call it what they call it, mm -hmm. you know, just like every generation has but, but like, like, slang like Dr. Or, Dr. Uh, me is saying right is it all of the media noise is around vaping you know it's a from what you folks are saying it's a, it's a misapplied term it's a it's a term that's meant to brand this behavior as something that it's not um, if adults started calling it electronic smoking and so on um, and I guess my broader question is what do you think works to get kids not to use this stuff or to give it up Again, I think it's like more community-based, parent-based. The parents can get on board, the community gets on board. I think you'll, you'll see a lot, the users maybe drop. I mean, yeah, along yeah, with, sure. yeah, you know, just everyone has to be on board. I mean, if we get rid of it, like at the malls, I mean, they see it less, the availability, because I mean, it's not regulated so much there. If a person gets busted selling to someone under 21, they don't lose their license. It's not like alcohol where the shop is closed, they're out of business, they got to move somewhere else, rename their company. Well, that's the power of permitting, right? Mm -hmm. And then um, advertising, marketing. Uh, you, you couldn't put, we don't, have, we don't have billboards in Hawaii, but I remember a big crackdown was on just advertising. Is that part of your, your guys' scheme? Yes, I think it has to be. So like this visibility in the mall would go away, theoretically. It's a lot of dramatic stuff. How, how confident are you that we can turn the corner on this? Well, I mean, we have to learn from our lessons from fighting big tobacco, and the e-cigarette companies are taking all their, you know, the playbook from big tobacco back in the past, and they've actually uh, made it even more sophisticated, and it's even more effective now because of social media and the way that they're able to quickly get, you know, uh, influencers and you know various other people to say hey this is something that you should be using and so we need to think about you know how did we address things with big tobacco um, so you know education prevention um, appropriate licensing and taxation and treat it the same way because nicotine is so addictive it's unlike any other product so you start to use this product and you may be stuck on it for life with, with an addiction that you do not want. You know, the, the stories of young people who are so addicted that they cannot think about anything else, right? They, their grades suffer, um, they're not able to, you know, participate in, in sports or music or things that um, would carry them into, you know, greater things uh, later on in life. This is really negatively in, impacting them. And, I think as a pediatrician, I feel the urgency because each year that we wait, we see the numbers go up and up and up, right? So I want to see that 
those numbers start to go back down again. You know, if we wait another year, another year, another year, that's another, you know, graduating class from high school that's, um, you know, have at least used uh, the e-cigarettes uh, at least once. You, you know, I, I read an interesting point in one of the, some of the articles I was looking at prior to this show because I knew that we weren't going to have anyone from the industry on the show, and I don't mean to be defending the industry in any way, but um, the uh, one of the points that was made was that it's sort of a grassroots small business entrepreneurs they came up with this 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 thing and they were all strong small independent businesses and now that the big regulations come in now they're playing right into the hands of big tobacco because they know how to play the regulatory game and how to do the marketing so big tobacco is going to win from all this and the little vape guys are going to go the way of the dinosaurs. But Big Tobacco owns most of the vape companies now. At this point, they've owned, owned yes. the big ones. Altria is one of the bigger players. Mm -hmm. what, do, what do their lobbyists tell you when, when you start coming in with stuff like this? What, what do they say? They don't come to see me. <laughs> oh, they don't see you. <laughs> what do they say to other people or what do other people know. tell you? <laughs> so I, I was having that thought of like, you know, someone saying, well, you're anti-capitalist, of mm -hmm. saying you got to, mm -hmm you know, and, you know, kill the flavors or, you know, ban the flavors. But, you know, you think of other products, like we used to have lead in our paint. And, you know, there was bans on toys coming from other countries, importing them because it had lead in paint. And, you know, the worry was that a kid is going to put the toy in his mouth and then they're going to get lead poisoning. So there was a ban on that and then, or he had to regulate it somehow. You know, we've banned the use of asbestos, right? So there's products that we've had that we, then determined it was in use for long term, and then all of a sudden, like, wow, it causes cancer, it causes lung cancer, or it's causing brain damage. So they pull those items from the shelf. Like any item that we have, if there's a recall, I mean, how many times do we get, I don't know, anyone has like a car that they get their vehicle recalled to get their airbag checked? You know, I got a couple of questions from people who clearly want to see some sort of education, you know, for kids asking what approach works, right? So um, one person, we should also tell children that if they are told to do something contrary to their parents' advice, it usually is to make somebody money. Like, because kids don't like greed, they don't like big, you know, companies taking their money, you know, and they don't trust big corporations. Mm -hmm. So I think that might be one concept, you know, like, you know, they're trying to make you sick and make money off of you. Yeah. So I mean, there are ways to shine light on how this industry is run. I mean, the Truth Initiative is one of those that's you know run by young people, and they have a very provocative but um, you know an honest look at the industry type of. Uh, are they into the electronic campaigns. smoking thing yet? I know they came mostly out of the tobacco. Side. Yes. So they've they've started to have some of that information as well. So and locally, um, you know, a Hawaii Public Health Institute ha helped set up. Uh, 808 No Vape, and they have a lot of great information on there as well. And there's a group called, from the same mm -hmm. organization, Tobacco Free Kids, and they're moving into uh, making sure that people understand and their peers understand the problems with vaping. Do you see kids in school um, lobbying their friends, and are there, are there advocates for good health in school? I, I don't know that I've ever heard of that. It's a kind of an unpopular uh, approach. Um, you, you figure, uh, yes, for me, I'm 44, so I graduated high school in 94. Um, you know, it, it was like the thought of like, okay, if like someone's smoking, you're like one of the, I don't know, one of the naughty kids, more so, not like, and, and going with that, right, now it's saying like with, with vaping or, you know, electronic smoking, it's it hits kids at every angle, A students, B students, athletes, you know, kids, all variations. There isn't any discrimination for those who are using it. So it, it hits all realms of the student population. So it's not to say like, oh, those are the ones, they're over there, they're hanging out by the band room, or they're hanging out by the, the track, you know. It's, there isn't that certain group of kids that are the naughty kids that are doing it. It's infiltrated all kids and so it's a tough sell for kids and I was 
Yeah, because the question that I got from a viewer was, are there any peer-based programs in the state to stop vaping? We did talk about tobacco-free kids. That is the you know, 808 so No Vape is it, trying to. So there's the, some. Yeah. Well, it, I'm it, trying to start one at Campbell. It's a rough start. Uh, <laughs> so it's called Save Hawaii, uh, Students Against Vaping E-Cigarettes. We just had um, a logo contest uh, this past, uh, right before, or in December. We just awarded the, the winner for that. I don't have any graphics. I'm sorry. I should have no, it's okay. But I mean, I, so we've only got a few more seconds left. Really quickly, how, how confident are you that we are going to be able to get our hand, handle on this in the next few years, Senator? I think we're going to be able to do it. I think the, uh, the will is out there among many young people, and I think that's, they're going to help us make the case to the others. Doctor, in the last 15 seconds, are you hopeful? Uh, very much so. So I think people are starting to understand. Uh, we have our campaign, Flavors Hook Kids, and that is the truth, that flavors are there to hook our young people. Okay, thank you very much, all of you, and mahalo to all of you for joining us tonight. And we thank our guests, Senator Rosalind Baker, Chair of the Commerce, Consumer Protection and Health Committee, Steve Bortle, Campbell High School teacher, and Dr. Brian Mee, pediatrician in private practice and director of the Smoke Free Families Program at Kapilani Medical Center. Next week on Insights, climate change. Now, the kids are behind climate change, right? Uh, please join us for that discussion. I'm Daryl Huff for Insights on PBS Hawaii. Aloha. <laughs>